So uh, we have talked a lot over the past few days about the um, kind of the business of big data, not, not just big data in the tech terms. We got a million sessions going on right now over there uh, around all the technology of it. And lately we've been, or in this track, we've been looking at what are the implications to people, their careers, their organizations, um, trying to take a much broader view of what this stuff means to the, to the market in general. So we just finished up in our last session, for those who are in here with uh, Peter Goldmacher from Cowan, give us a nice update on where uh, a, a Wall Street analyst kind of sees this big data world. And now I'm really excited to have a conversation with uh, Brian Gentile, who's currently the CEO of JasperSoft, and uh, he is also a, a good friend of mine and uh, has helped me a lot in my transition from a general manager into a CEO role with, with Datastax, so thank you very much for that. Um, but Brian also has an incredible uh, background in the industry from a lot of different perspectives, and he is one of the more, I would say, cogent thinkers about, about thinking about business as opposed to just coming in and I said, you know, we, we, these sessions here, we're not doing commercials. We're really here to talk about real problems in the market, how people need to think about this stuff, and he does a phenomenal job of that. So um, happy to have him here today. And Brian, why don't we start with just a little, give us a jet tour of the salient points in your career kind of that, that brought you to where you are today. Super, glad to. Uh, hello, nice to see everybody. Great time here at uh, Cassandra Summit. I'm thrilled to be here. And it's been a pleasure getting to work with Billy and the Cassandra Data Stacks team over the last couple of years. We've had a lot of fun. Um, I have been in information technology for 28 years, uh, nine of those with Apple, three with Sun, uh, the remainder with a variety of mid-size and startup software companies, many of them focused on data, data management, and business intelligence. Companies like Brio, Hyperion, Informatica. I served for two years on JasperSoft's board of directors as an independent director before being asked to come in as CEO in 2007, very late 2007. So I just passed the five-year mark uh, as CEO of JasperSoft. Congratulations. And yep. thank you for your sponsorship, by the way. Forgot glad to say to. that. Yeah, glad to. All right, so let's dive right in here. Um, you wrote back in 2011 in October for Forbes magazine. I'm going to read the quote. You said, sometime even prior to this new millennium, the primary factors of production have now assuredly become time, information, and capital. And you said, I submit that the primary relevance of land and labor has diminished, not completely, but measurably, from their prominence during agrarian and industrial economic times. So that was a couple of years ago. We've, we've learned a lot in the past two years. The market's moving really fast. Yep. You still hold to that? Has it changed? Has it strengthened? Has it weakened? What, what would you say about that quote today? Only strengthened is the short answer. I mean, we look, we, for 25 to 30 years, we have clearly witnessed this remarkable shift in the economics of information, especially in the most advanced economies. Um, the need to compete on the basis of speed is in every business, indelibly, unmistakably. Our ability to use more information and turn it into a competitive advantage almost applies universally to the mom and pop retail chain as it does to the industrial giants. So putting more information to work is the big task at hand. The fact that you have 1,100 registrants and attendees here is just one small but important example of this trend. I call it, I genuinely refer to it as a new economic battleground. And you either get good at this or you suffer and perish. It's that simple. 1,400, don't undersell us. 1,400, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's, a good, it's a good number anyway. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, and obviously I, I agree. I think it's been really strong. And by the way, I told all the other sessions, we're going to, about halfway through, we're going to stop and take some Q&A. So be thinking about what questions you have. And it's a lot more interesting if you guys have good questions and we can have a, a conversation about this. So you share uh, an attribute with um, Godfrey, who I talked to yesterday from, yeah. from Splunk. And there was something else that was interesting in that article. I know you. I know you don't do anything by accident. You're very intentional with your words, very eloquent. And you didn't use the words big data one time in that article. Mm -hmm. and it was a pretty long article in Forbes, and this was a couple of years ago. And yep. I, that doesn't strike me as an accident on, on your part. You talked about the three Vs. You talked about onslaught of data. But 
Why did you intentionally avoid what in, in 2011 was the beginning of the, the big data hype? Why yeah. did you avoid that? Yeah, because you know, truthfully, I was appealing to somebody who's interested in the intersection of economics and information technology. And for that person, the, the notion of multi-structured, schemaless data types that are coming in in higher velocity and higher variety forms than we've ever seen before is simply not relevant. What is relevant is that in that mass of data represents kernels of information, real information that could send an organization, an enterprise on a new trajectory if it's used properly. And, and so I, I consciously didn't talk about big data because it's just data. And in a few years from now, that I think we really will lose that adjective. I think it will just be data again. The way we, the way we have to deal with it as technologists is forever changed, make, make no mistake about that. Uh, but, but the fact that it represents the potential of harnessing information to create a competitive advantage is no different whether it's coming in from a stream, click stream analysis or sensor-based data or traditional structured relational types coming from transactional-based data stores. No, no difference. And, and from, a, from a standpoint of how do you use it to compete, there's really no difference. Ultimately, fusing information from all these sources to create real genuine insight and not just human insight but system-to-system -system insight is, is how we create take chunks of time out of processes, and create genuine competitive advantage. So you're in an interesting position at JasperSoft because uh, similar to my role at Quest in, in my last company, we were very agnostic to the technologies. In fact, right. the more that won, the better. We, we liked yeah. that. A, a diverse environment was a good environment for us. And you're in a kind of a similar boat, although for you, it's also challenging. So early on, the, the big data term was, uh, I would argue, synonymous with Hadoop. So I yeah. think you would say Hadoop was big data, big data was Hadoop. Um, that has shifted a lot in the last two, three years. G give us some insight into how, how you view, view big data as it relates to these new technologies, or even just data as it relates to these technologies. Where do they all fit? So this, I think this is the crux of where we are right now. I, I, whenever, I, I just returned from a trip across, basically across the globe. In the last three months, I've been on... Most, through most of Europe and most of Asia and the Pacific. And what's fascinating is regardless of where you are in the world, Hadoop does equal big data. It's gotten more diverse over the last year or so, but it still by and large represents one's first thoughts about a technology represented with big data. And there's a, there's a, a weakness in that because we all know that our technologists, we know that the Hadoop framework has certain advantages. It has certain strengths for which certain applications and uses are, are very nicely suited. And then there are others for which it's incredibly poorly suited, at least today. And there are many other types of data constructs, like Cassandra, that is mu are much better suited for certain problems and overcoming certain issues. And I, I fear that, and I see too many customers, too many uh, organizations starting down a path based on familiarity. Uh, they'll choose Hadoop when it's poorly suited and they'll go to implement, and, and they're trying to get it to do something that's not well designed to do, and they fail. And failure, especially with a new overly hyped technology, represents usually a big setback, organizationally, politically. And so that can cause um, a you know, significant delay in finding and competing well. So customers have to think about this. Organizations need to think about it as begin with the end in mind. The, the fundamentals haven't changed. We've got business problems. We have technologies to solve them. We need to think about how to construct things using the right technologies. Whether or not their name is plastered on the front page of every website and newspaper is not relevant to the fact that we have to s pick the right solution to solve the right problem. And, and so when, when I speak with customers about this, they get it. Um, but otherwise, many of them don't take the time to go look at the various categories. Maybe a, a rich uh, SQL-based analytic database is fine. Maybe you do need a NoSQL store, and if you do, of which flavor? Maybe Hadoop is the right overall framework, but until you really dig into it deeply and understand and begin with the end of mind, you could easily tumble down a path and find out, find out six months later it was the wrong path. So we talked to the, a lot of the other panelists about the, the actual database layer itself, yep. and we talked about how I think the, the overwhelming conclusion is that it is a heterogeneous world. We've, we've kind of started calling it, we talked about polyglot programmers. We kind of call it now polyglot persistence, meaning you're going to have, get comfortable with it, because it's going to, ha it's going to yeah. happen. You're yep. going to have a diversity of data yep. stores and figuring out which one's right. But <clears throat> that nuance is sometimes lost on executives talking about database layers. But analytics is not lost on executives. Like, yeah, they better not. understand it and understand what it means. And that's where you have... Uh, an interesting dialogue because you have to talk with the, the multiplicity of, of 
stores on the back end of that mm -hmm. data, but then you got to talk to the business right. and make sure they understand what the data means. Is this partly what's behind your push? Because I've heard you on this on numerous occasions uh, talk about data, not just big data. You, yeah. you really do want to get past that. Yeah. Is that one of the reasons why you're trying so hard to get that message across? It, it is. It's fundamentally about bringing contextually relevant information together so that the right decision can be made at the right place at the right time. So we talk a lot about contextual relevance. And mining are looking through an enormous amount of data, regardless of its structure and origin, is critical to finding the context that a decision maker needs to make a decision. And, and so as an, in, in analytics, we strive for this context. Context is a big deal. Um, putting the right relational information in, in the right visual format adjacent to some other completely different data type and data source, because that's the way the human mind thinks about that problem, that, that's a really interesting puzzle to solve. And we need more puzzle solvers who can understand the business and the technology uh, and help bring that contextual relevance to a business problem. It's actually easier when you're solving a system-to-system -system problem because the inputs are fewer. When you're trying to solve a human problem, a human decision-making problem, you have to think about context and about the relevant data points that should be exposed as some sort of information that can actually advance the decision uh, faster, better, cheaper. So advancing the decision. We've talked a lot in the past few days about the political challenges that are ensuing inside of organizations around the technologies and how sometimes um, very poor and actually crippling decisions are being made, often uh, by executives who don't have the data, don't have the information, and they're going on corporate inertia or maybe their own comfort level for two, three decades, yeah. right? Um, I don't know the analytics space nearly as well as I know the infrastructure space, but do those same political challenges exist inside of an organization in terms of getting consensus, building consensus on what do we need to see, how do we need to see it? Because one thing we want to equip our audience with is, uh, A, things to look out for that mm -hmm. we've seen happen poorly inside mm -hmm. of companies, and then mm -hmm. B, we'll come to, and then how to smooth those potholes and yep. get over those, those uh, gulfs, right? So do those same risks and battles exist in the analytics side of the house, or is it really just limited to infrastructure? No, they do. They exist on a different plane, but they exist. I'll give you it's an obvious example. Um, in the analytic world, there's, a, there's always a push and shove between the technologists who know the most about the data, its structure, and how to orient it, and those who need it to make business decisions. Right. So if I need a, an analytic view or a report formatted in a certain way, and I'm a business user, I have a couple of options. If I'm smart enough and the tool is easy enough, I might be able to do it myself. Or I have to ask you. And if my requests keep coming in at a pace that you can't handle, you're going to say, no mas, I can't do this. So the balance of power and knowledge has to be right-sized for the right organization. There are politics involved, there's skill sets involved, and there's tool and technology selection involved to help make the right solution emerge. So yes, th this, the, the big data, to use the word big data, it does for, it, it provides us with another really powerful opportunity to bring business and technologists together in an organization to solve a bigger picture problem in a way that's necessary and probably not obvious before. Are, are we gonna be in a world of uh, polyglot analytics? Mm -hmm. Is there going to be, or do we just need to get comfortable with the fact that there's gonna be analysis being done all over the place by different teams, which can lead to different versions of the truth, which can lead to some very bad meetings. So yeah, it can. What are we going to do about that? Is that here to stay? It's an interesting thought. Um, so I do believe that right now, a very small fraction of the average enterprise actually uses analytics to make a decision. We know this from countless studies over two decades. We know that the number at its best is 20, maybe 25% in the most advanced enterprises. So that means that 75% of the workers who are classified as knowledge workers are, are still making most or if not all their decisions based upon gut instinct. So I would say polyglot persistence applied to analytics is still superior to what's going on today, which is 75% nothing. Uh, what we believe at Jaspersoft, and not to go into any commercial, but to simply say we think analytics and reporting and um, new analytic views should be inside of the applications that you use every day that they should be the intelligence inside of those applications so that you don't have to leave your chosen environment to go do analytics. It should come to you. I, I liked, I've been quoted as saying, you know, analytics is a thing that you do, not a place that you go. 
and, and that's how it should be. And I'd, I'll take that over, I'll take that and a slight chance for multiple variations of the truth versus what's going on today every time. Th that number is kind of staggering when you look at the budgets for what's being spent on analytics. Yeah. Um, what is causing that dissonance between dollars in and use out? Because you're, you're telling me, if, if you asked an organization who in a procurement department was saying we spent this much on analytics, yeah. they would be mortified, I would think, to hear that only 25% of the knowledge workers in the organization are making decisions based on data. Yeah. Where is it going? If we're spending all this money and time and effort, why is it not being used? There's a huge, so this, it's a big political hotball right now. It's, there's a lot of shelfware, and it is a matter of, um, of uh, complexity and cost. The, the traditional tools that have been provided in the analytics world are too difficult, too costly, and complicated. So you have to think about the X number, Y percent of people in an organization that have the skill to use it. And, and the, uh, the complexity factor has, has prevented it from going much further than that. And that's, that's the real crux of the problem. It has to be vastly simpler, self-service enabled, embedded into the things we do every day, and incredibly affordable. Those factors drive not 25% use, but 95% use. So as I'm setting up my new environments, and we have a lot of problems with, um, we talked about how, how projects get adopted, and there's, there's three primary ways they can get adopted in an organization. You can um, sort of go rogue yeah. and just do it, and then you beg for forgiveness and you try and figure out what the ramifications are. You can get an official prototype underway for a small project and kind of kick it off. Or you can try and go build 100% consensus, which I think is the foolish, the most foolish of all those opportunities. Um, so in this world, as we move from 25% to hopefully, let's at least say 75%, mm -hmm. how is that going to happen? Is it going to be rogue projects? Is it going because we hear all the time about desktop BI and, yep. and the disruption that that causes? And so how is it going to happen inside of a company? What what should our audience be looking for? And quite frankly, what should, what should they be promoting yeah. to get this ratio something that's acceptable? I, I think it's truthfully, it's going to be a combination of some rogue projects and some in your middle, your middle tier, which is sort of start with something very de well defined. You can get, you can look at a solution and an answer in days or weeks, not months or quarters, uh, so that you can show progress. You not you spend very little to nothing, depending on the tools that you use, except your time, and you can demonstrate real advancement in a short amount of time. You get that success, then you can move on. So I, I'm just a huge believer that you've got to start with small chunks, show some success. If you can do it under the banner of a defined project rather than rogue, that's probably better politically. Yeah, it's, it's better, but sometimes I'd say it feels like there's no other way to do sometimes it. Sometimes there's so, no other way. That's yeah. why I admit that rogue will be still, still a way to get it done. So a lot of the pain in Cassandra where, where our customers will come to us is because they, they are dealing with an infrastructure problem that is so extreme in some cases yeah. that, that they, they have to do it. And these are the people who started with Cassandra at the O dot, oh my God version, right? Yeah. Like, can't believe they ran this in production. <laughs> um, but they needed to do it and they've been doing it for a while. So when you start a new project, if these, if these guys are starting a new project and it involves Cassandra technology like that, should they be thinking immediately about analytics? According to you, they should, because it sounds like if they don't, they're going to run into this problem of, great, I have all the data. And I will tell you guys, uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago, uh, I was at one of our meetups, and I heard a guy who had the courage to stand up and say, I now have everything in Cassandra. I can capture all the rights. I am completely redundant. I'm not going to go down. I have all the data I need, and I have no idea what's in my database. And it had grown to the point where he just yeah. didn't know what to do with it and didn't know yeah. about it. Yeah. So whose role is that yeah. to figure that out? And, and when should you start thinking about that in a project? In other words, do we still need a, uh, a, the, the data dictionary team, you know, the, the team that's yeah. going to be the, the owner of the data definitions? Or how are we going to handle this? That's, so I think that ultimately the, the whole metadata issue um, in semantic layers is going to be the biggest, one of the biggest things we have to tackle organizationally. And it's a technology problem and it's an organizational problem. So just, step just back and give a little color on semantic layer. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? So there, there's there, the different layers of those who interact with the data. They're those who know enough about the transaction type to know how to capture it. And so to partially answer your question, I think, yeah, if you know that a certain data type is going to be value to your organization, 
the, the different data stores that are available today, like Cassandra, are inexpensive enough that you should just start throwing the data in there. There's, you, know, you probably aren't applying any schema to it right away if it's minimal schema at best. And the person that's doing that it doesn't have to know a lot about the business use potentially. They just have to know enough about the technology to make that happen efficiently. The, the next couple of layers though, where you start introducing terms and, and, and teams of people like data scientists and data explorers, these are the people who have to understand what's in the data. What, 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 might, what kernels of knowledge might come from that data if only it were viewed or parsed or reported on in some, in some format. There, there's a process that you have to go through to, to look at the data in various views, use a tool to expose it, and it's gonna take some iterations, but you know, the person with the right skill can find an enormous amount of knowledge. Um, so I think there are layers of this. It's organizational skill, it's uh, structure of the technology, it's politics to some degree again, because ultimately defining that, mapping it, and understanding what, because five years later, yeah. what do we remember about what's in that data store could be hugely valuable or it could be completely wasted depending on how you've structured, depending on how you've defined it or how you've labeled it. And you know, it's interesting. I think that NoSQL presents a hidden opportunity in what you just said, and here's why. Christos was up here earlier from Netflix and we were yeah. talking about how Christos, is a back, his background is relational. He was a relational DBA. And in his world, he said, when we would build a relational schema, once we had all the relationships in place, you could then traverse those relationships all day long sure. and yeah. ask questions a lot later. Yep. But he made a very strong point to say, when you want to run a very a highly efficient, highly performant Cassandra environment, you better know the question you're going to ask. And then he leaned in and he said, sure. you better know the question you want to sure. ask, yeah. right? Because if you don't know that up front, he's going to run into problems later. So I think there's an opportunity to get with the business people and really ask ahead of time, what do you want to know? Yeah. Because then if we model that data right, you're going to get performance right. on top of the this answers. Right. Yeah. But here's the challenge with that. And here's a question for you. Who are those people by role type in an organization that the technology team, the developer team who's writing the transactional application, if these guys are trying to bring together disparate people inside their company, yeah. then who do they need to connect with whom? Yeah. Where do they need to start talking? So there's a combination of roles, right? There's nothing today that there's no one single place, but there's a lot of talk about the data scientist role, which is part data miner, part data steward, because he knows he or she knows a lot about the structure of the data and the potential for it. I, I like to think of that person as the person that doesn't know yet what questions to ask of the data, but they're going to uncover a bunch of great, great, great questions to ask because they know enough about it and they know enough about the technology to go start mining it, right? But they inherently are starting out on a path that says, I think that there's value in this data, but I don't yet know exactly what questions to ask, which is wonderful. This, the fact that we have so many highly capable schema-less or minimal schema data stores today that provide a, lots of agility after you've figured out what questions to ask, um, that's pretty cool. Uh, that's one of maybe one of the most important breakthroughs. Then there's the data explorer. And data explorer is the person that says, I know what questions I'd like to ask of that data, but is that data ready to answer my questions? Mm -hmm. That person doesn't know a lot about the structure of the data. They know a lot about the business use of it. Necessary, but not sufficient. So these roles, you know, you've got the traditional data steward, you've got the, the new emerging data scientist, and then you have the data explorer. It's gonna take all three of these in order to make genuinely big insights occur from enormous data stores. Great. So uh, I'm gonna pause, we're, we're about halfway through, and I'm gonna see if uh, we have any questions on what's been discussed so far, or perhaps anything you'd like to hear in, in the remaining half? Yes. Um, I guess from the perspective of uh, one thing I'm not hearing is strategy. So most organizations have strategies. And within that strategy, uh, they have business processes and the data that's produced from those business processes, which is then uh, essentially captured on the data side, which is in the analytics data. So I see an opportunity uh, if you have that chain between Jaspersoft and data stacks to essentially um, provide that business facing technology capability as long as they keep that paradigm. It doesn't matter who's doing it if they understand what the strategy is for the business side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where it all starts. True? So, so the feedback was uh, that if you really keep the value chain of strategy, leads to processes, right. leads to data then I think what you're saying is you, you will run a less of a risk of finding misalignment, right, between what the team implemented versus what the business needs to know. Correct, and that's everyone. That's from the developer all the way up to the front end user. 
Yeah, that's a tall order. It's a good one, but I, I have found um, through the first half of my career, I was a developer, and um, I have found that to be a challenging, for, for any number of reasons, a challenging value chain to keep intact. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you my, why from my perspective, I'd love to hear your perspective, Brian, is mm -hmm. the, the business sometimes, usually, almost always, is a lousy predictor of what they're really going to want. So the, the challenge that I had 15, 20 years ago as a developer still exists today, which is the business tells you one thing and you build it. And then they say, that's not what I told you. Yeah, yeah it is. Well, no, what I meant was, mm. oh, okay, so let me put my mind reading hat on. What you meant was this. Well, now it's all jacked up because I already did the first thing and now I got to unwind that. And then now we try and bolt fit things on and it, and it ruins that value chain and it becomes very difficult. So I don't know, have you insight into how to make that better is that real? Do you see that same problem? Yeah, I absolutely do. Because in textbook-wise, you're right. In reality, though, today we have to be way more agile than that because processes actually affect strategy. So we think we have the right strategy. We go build the right processes and the right information systems to support that strategy. But in the midst of all that, stuff, stuff happens, I almost said. You but stuff happens, okay. right? Hey, we and, had Peter yeah. Goldmuck in here talking about porn and Viagra. Oh, and all, right. You're, you're, all right. You're fine. Good, okay, <laughs> good. Okay. So just between us, shit happens, right? And so, so you, you're, you're, what you thought was a clean strategy that you need to go execute against, all of a sudden the competition did something you didn't expect, a new entrant comes in, a new technology comes in, all this thing, stuff changes. And so there's much more of a parallel. I mean, you talk to Clay Christensen, you, t you, get, you, you, go, you go talk to the, the latest stuff from Michael Porter, and you see they're all adapting to this matter of strategy and building out processes that are far more parallel than they were even 10 years ago. But I think both your technologies are flexible enough for you to run through those frames. That's the hope. Yeah, that is the hope. Yeah. Exactly. It, and it goes back to picking the right technology. Exactly. You want to pick the right technology to solve the right kind of problem for you. So, yes. Can, can you repeat the question? I think quite yeah. Good. So do you, you're, t you're talking about building out like an analytical view, a predefined analytical view of some big data source to solve some specific business problem, functionally oriented. Now, this is what Godfrey at Splunk represents. I think Godfrey and the Splunk team have done a masterful job being a big data company without ever talking about big data until you know it became cool and hyped. And so they, but the, the point is that they have built out an analytic application for instead of a functional area, it's a, uh, I'm sorry, rather than a vertical area, it's a functional area. It's an IT team, right? Web log management, application logs, and so on. Um, so their audience is the IT team. But what they've done is they've predefined the click stream, the, uh, the, 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 the schema, the actual data, you know, the, all the way back to the data model. And, and then they understand a best practice set of views for that user. It's a wonderful, I think you'll see hundreds, of, maybe thousands of these that are actually taking a big, big data source behind it. And by the time it gets to the end user, the end user doesn't know that it's stored in Cassandra or it's filtered through all these mechanisms because they're getting their business-oriented view solved. I think it's brilliant. Well, but I, but I think the challenge there too is the custom app, the internal custom app versus the yeah. the used packaged app or SaaS app, mm -hmm. right? So the ones that I've had experience with where it's gone sideways is the custom app internally. Um, that's where things can get a little sure can. little more dicey. So another question about? So I know this is uh, differentiating between data and knowledge. And yeah. Kind of levels, switch when you were talking about yeah. Yeah, yeah. So do you follow some sort of process? Is there a, you know, agile type process that you have to follow in order to pull off the, the useful stuff along the way? 
you know, I, I think this is the holy grail that we're on, so we're on right now. Please, please so, please. Yeah, so the, the concept of um, building out a process, that a new organizational process that would yield real knowledge from enormous amounts of data, uh, it's, it's, been, it's never been done before in any meaningful way, at least repeatable way, um, and never been done in a way that we'd all want to go try to emulate. And, and with these new technologies, it makes the possibilities for that both harder and simpler at the same time, meaning the possibilities are there, but the complexity is still there at the same time. Did I, did I kind of get that right? Yeah. yeah, it's a good summary. So let me give you an example of this, because I, I think that it's, your question is so much at the, at the heart of the, of the organizational matter today with knowledge from data that uh, it deserves a minute of, of anecdote. I was in the, in the United Kingdom about three months ago, and I was visiting with the largest gaming company, online gaming company, in the United Kingdom. It's a company called Jagex, and they produce uh, a massively parallel, massive multiplayer online game called RuneScape. Anybody use, anybody a RuneScape player? No, okay, I'm, well, I'm surprised. You gotta go to the tech session. Is that right, I gotta, go across, I gotta go across the way. There's somebody <laughs> in the back, okay. Um, they have hundreds of millions of players, literally. Hundreds, I, 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 this was really fascinating for me. And we sat in their giant theater in Cambridge, and we watched the engineers as they were tweaking the final elements of a, game, of a new version of RuneScape that they were gonna be releasing online in just, in just a week's time or so. And so it was down to crunch time. And they do this in a theater because they have so many people involved in the final, sort of the, everything about it is just so well guarded. And this struck me as, as a, a really interesting example of your question, right? Because in this room, in this theater, there were people from every aspect of the company as well as those in their kind of community outside of the company. It was about 30 or 40 people in this theater. And they were all systematically providing feedback on the final elements of the game. And it was gonna be a week long process. And that, that's a, maybe an ex exaggerated example of, of what we have to think about now in all types of businesses. Right? It is about agility and bringing people together, looking at technology and, in ways, and using technology in ways that there, maybe their comfort level would have been zero earlier. We have to have a breed, uh, a group of, of organizational of people in the organization who are simply more comfortable with technology than we've ever had before. And we're going to have to be able to mix the most deep technologists with the business people and everything in between to make the agility and the processes emerge and turn that data into information. Otherwise, competitive advantage will go to your competitor who does it better. I have another fun example about Toyota, but I'll, I don't want to talk too much, so I'll try to see how it applies later. I think one answer to that question as well, and then we'll come up here. I think one answer to that question as well is, uh, what I would like to see personally as organizations get better at is putting a temperature on every bit of data they collect. And you come up with your own internal gauge. I, I don't care, like it, you know, a seven to 10 is hot, and a, and a four to six is warm, and a zero to three is cold, right? But I think that that is required for the rest of the business to kind of get their heads around it. And then you, you define what does hot mean, okay? Well, hot means, that I have to make you know, human real-time decisions back and forth on this piece of data. And then by doing that, I think that if we got a, a concept of the, the temperature of the data really socialized in the organization, that we could then have better conversations about how to learn from that data and where to iterate from it. Because some people may say, for me to learn, to extract my piece of knowledge, I, I need to look at data that is going to be 18 months in aggregate. Well, then you could have your definition and go, okay, well, if the data is required to be live longer than two weeks, we're gonna define that as cold. Mm -hmm. And then that would help you understand mm -hmm. what store to put it in. And that would help you understand who needs to look at it. But today what's happening is, because we don't have that concept a lot of times, that we, we get misaligned on who needs the data when and for what purpose. So I think just one small thing we could do is tag it with a temperature and then have people at least have a dialogue around, why do you think that's cold? I need that data great, immediately yeah. for this service level agreement with my customer. You know, that's hot to me. And then it could be exposed to a wider team. But you do have to involve people up front. I like the, the theater concept. Mm -hmm. well, one more question here. So uh, I guess the question is uh, your, your experience or your thoughts on, you know, while the amount of data being collected from uh, things like sensors is starting to grow. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. What about trying to train our analytical engine to prompt some uh, mid skill level uh, person on here's what happened historically when this tensor was like this? Yeah. And so, I mean, kind of on top of analytics, a, a, a another layer on top that provides uh, kind of you know running runtime intelligence. Yes. So th this is a, a derivative of the, so the question is about how to, instead of expecting everybody to become magically more knowledgeable in these technologies, how could we use the technology to provide another level of intelligent analytics to, to make the, everybody more capable? Is that, is that a good, okay. So this is another angle on the analytic application question, because what I could say is that what Splunk has done is they've made an analytic application that makes an IT administrator whose job it is to monitor application health much smarter, because they've essentially built a set of best practice workflows, clicks, and analytic views that they know from, from working with hundreds and thousands of customers how that job should be done better. So that means, theoretically, any IT person who's using Splunk and they're using it properly, should be better at, at analyzing web logs and application logs and so on to know what's going on with the health of their systems. I think that's at the heart of what you're, and so that, this is why I'm so bullish on analytic applications in front of, of big data sources that are providing that level of intelligence. They're essentially making the business user better at what he or she does. But I don't want to give up on education, though, I got to tell you, because it's one of my pet peeves. I, I worry about uh, the most advanced economies like the United States who are simply not graduating enough science, technology, engineering, and math graduates to sustain the kind of innovation and building that we need to go do. So I, I want to push on both of those. We need to push on education, and that has to do with Washington and, and government uh, bureaucracy and, and uh, curriculum as well. I tell you, I'm not that impressed with what I've seen in even some of the world's leading uh, institutions in terms of technology curriculum. And at the same time, we need to use technology to be, to be better at this as well. So I agree. When you, when you talk about making the business better, you, you often mean faster, right? Being able to respond faster to problems, but with the correct answer, yeah, right? Yeah, it's, so right, it's, it's pushing it's down accuracy the, and speed. Right. Yep. So can you give us an example of a company, maybe you can do a public company, maybe you can't, um, that's doing it well, you know, that you've seen this in real life, you've seen them actually take analytics and fundamentally make a difference on how they run their business. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, now, I, now I get to use my Toyota example. That's a Toyota? Yeah, you like okay, walked ahead. right into that, yeah. <laughs> so it's been said that Toyota produced the first generation Prius, the first generation Prius in 15 months. From the, time that the, from the, the moment that the project was green-lighted to the time at which the first unit rolled off the production assembly line, 15 months of duration. That was unprecedented. This was back in 2006, 2005, when the first generation Prius was available. Now, we're the third or fourth generation of Toyota Prius, if you've been following that model line of cars. Um, but what's phenomenal about this is a few things when you dissect it. Uh, firstly, that was the first mainstream hybrid drive car built in, in that level of production capacity. Admittedly, Toyota had been experimenting with hybrid drive systems for a number of years prior to the green lighting of this project. So they weren't flat-footed by any means. I don't want to overstate it. But 15 months from the time that they got the green light to the time that first Prius rolled off the line was about 70% faster than anything else that had gone on in their competitors at that point. The, the reason they needed to do that was because they knew that there was a window of opportunity to strike during oil prices and competition and consumer interest. You, you know, you guys have seen this in the press, where all of a sudden, if you have the right, uh, you have the right vehicle at the right time, boom, you, get a, you establish a foothold on the market. That's what they wanted to take advantage of. Also, before you dismiss this as a heavy goods manufacturing example, let me just remind you that even back when the first generation Prius was produced, it represented more lines of software than many of you have written in your careers. It was an amazing amount of software. So it was an incredible combination of fusing information technology, computer science, with manufacturing engineering, supply chain engineering, just an amazing array of things. How does Toyota do that? They measure and analyze everything. It's an amazing culture for this. Uh, is anybody here with Toyota, by chance? No, just, I, would, I, would have been, I should have asked that before I launched into my <laughs> Prius story. It would have been an important safety tip. But um, they, they, this is a real sense of pride, a real point of pride within Toyota as an organization. What, what I'd like to go check back in on that I admittedly don't know today is how long did it take them to produce the third generation Prius? That would be a really important point 
to this story that I don't have. I'd like to be able to say, and the third generation was produced in 15 days or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Godfrey told an interesting story about his Tesla on how hmm. much they collect, and you actually sign away when you're buying yeah. the car. There you go. Your, a lot of your privacy rights right. on yeah. what, you know, that data. There you go. See, Godfrey talks about Tesla, I talk about the Prius. There you, you go. See that? Right. You, you see that contrast <laughs> yeah, there? Yeah, little, yeah, I'm little just saying, I'm just saying, record. yeah. It's the whole, IP, it's the whole IPO thing gone to his head. A couple of billion dollar yeah. valuations, yeah. and yeah. you know, you're, you're buying a, a Tesla. A billion here, a billion there. Pretty yep. soon, you're talking about real money. Next question. Uh, I think we were over, you, have, you asked one, let's come back to your new question. That's your wheelhouse. Yeah. I should repeat the question. Yeah, so here you're talking about different layers of technology and people coming together successfully around different layers of technology in an organization. Um, and d did your question have any bias towards these new technology types? Yeah, so for example, earlier we mentioned that uh, big data for a lot of people needs to improve. So in yeah. the organization, uh, when they propose an alternative to that, where you need to use different Yeah. Into, uh, okay. The project, it would be helpful to point to use cases for success story where it's not just focused on one particular technology, one particular area, but it's a combination of yeah. these and the ecosystem. Okay, good. And best good. practices around that. Yeah. Well, first, my first caveat I have to offer on this question is that it's still early, right? We're still talking about, uh, even in my broadest travels, I would say um, when I work with customers, it's, they have, they're really proud of one really successful use case, harnessing some schemaless or just high velocity, high volume data type. They're really proud of that, as well they should be. Um, so now if you're talking about how do I look at that with a multiple view lens that says different organizations are benefiting, I'll give you, um, I'll go back to the United Kingdom with my gaming example, because that same company, uh, after I viewed this theater, the next set of, of discussions with them was, was with the technologists uh, the CFO of the company, the chief financial officer, and then the CEO came in during this meeting as well. And um, during this meeting, we talked about a host of what they called game telemetry data. And, and, but when they use the term telemetry in this setting, what they're referring to is, is what's happening within the game during the course of a gaming day. And they've defined best, pra best practice metrics for understanding what's going on inside, inside their game during the course of a day. Before this project, there was no standard for understanding what was going on. How many users doing what, with what kind of behavior, with what kind of next step in action, with what kind of purchase, and so on. They, they, every department within the company had their own view of this. So this forced them to standardize on what they now literally refer to as their game telemetry dashboard. And when we were sitting there with the technologists who were responsible for the data sources, the queries, the reports, and the dashboards, they were sitting right next to the CFO and the CEO. And they were all in alignment around this new dashboard. And, and so as they explained to me how they did this, and it involved a combination of big data stores, not just one, traditional relational data types, because they admittedly extracted some data out of those big data stores to provide certain views, and then my, my, my company's product at the front end to provide all the reports and dashboards. Um, but what was fascinating was when, we, when I said, okay, well, what's next? What's coming next? You guys have been nicely successful. There was four, at least four projects from each, that they each agreed on were the next four things that they're going to do with this very same technology stack. They're simply going to provide a new view and a new usage of this data. At the same time, they were analyzing um, a new technology, a new columnar-oriented um, rel underlying relational database that they wanted to use for some new, new techniques. But I was really Im impressed with the success across the whole company at the first project and the alignment they had and what they want to go do next with this data. And I got to tell you, they were excited about it too, which is pretty surprising. I mean, they're really excited about the insight that this is bringing to their company and to their, to their gaming environment. And I would argue, just to add to that, that um, 
it's, it's why Jaspersoft is a partner, right? You got to have a technology that can add, we are one small part of most of our projects. Even the big ones we're usually a part of. I mean, there's other things that happen beyond the databases even. So you got to have a technology that's flexible enough to be able to handle all these different types of components and, and all that stuff. So you got to get the right technology, then you got to get the right culture yeah. on, on top of it. So back over here, any question? Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, repeating the question, it's it's um, the data scientist seems like you know I don't know the albino black bear at this point. I don't. They yeah. seem hard to right. find. Nobody can yeah. figure out where they are yeah. and what they do and what they look like. And yeah. Um, and and the the question is, doesn't this have to change before we can make progress? And and I'd like you to explain. I get tired personally of the term big data. Yeah, it, it is so meaningless now to me that it, it's nauseating. And I, I know I'm a big data company, but it is so unbelievably overplayed. I don't know as much about the analytics side, but I got to tell you, from an outsider, I'm pretty sick of data scientists too. So, yeah. like, what what is this yeah, really all about in yeah. terms of uh, can we not live without a data scientist? I mean, what what, what is yeah. the reality? Yeah, I have the same reaction, by the way. It's, um, so the answer is somewhere in the middle, right? I mean, the, the truth is that the, all the predictions show that those who are really skilled in understanding these technologies and understanding data and the science of data, thus the term data scientist, uh, there are going to be far too few of them. That's very clear. But, but we, can't, we can't just be satisfied with that. We've got to go try to create more of them because the problems that are going to be solved are so big that even though there are a bunch of there are a number of efforts to make analytics easier, and I'm going to mention a couple of them in just a moment, even though that is true, and that will make the skill level required to interact with data and analytics, it will bring this, the needed skill level down. It doesn't lessen the strain on the whole framework, I'm afraid. I mean, I, I fundamentally believe we're going to need to, to raise the whole sea tied up to get what we need, right? There's no way around it. We can pretend like we can push it to the you know, business class user versus the, to, it's not gonna work. We have to bring everybody level up. And this is why when I speak at universities, I talk about curriculum for STEM subjects and requiring uh, everybody to take, uh, every student, to, to even liberal arts colleges should be required to have some amount of science, technology, engineering, and math in the curriculum. Um, so necessary. But what's happening on the front end of this technology where the end user meets, um, meets the stream of bits is uh, search interfaces, natural language, um, not just Boolean style searches like we've seen, but things that are more English-like. Uh, we'll see the introduction of a lot more of these things in the next five years. How useful they'll be will depend upon the entire technology chain. So I guarantee what will happen is the first implementations are not going to succeed very easily. And it won't necessarily be because of one piece of technology. It'll be because of the entire ontology from, from business user through to schematic and database layer. And so, but it will happen. And we'll see five years from now, we'll see much better interfaces that allow the skill set to be simpler and so on. But it doesn't lessen the need to be sharp analytically. It doesn't lessen the need to have some, a greater number of data scientists in the organization. Uh, but it will provide maybe a, a more ubiquitous use case, a more broadly used user type. I, I agree on the generational challenge, too. I, I think that yeah. uh, there, there are some things about the new generation that has me so excited, and there are some that has me really scared. Sure. And some of it is, not the least of which is a 16-year-old daughter next year, but mm -hmm. beside that. Yeah. Um, there you go. Their, their ability to um, not understand how to think for themselves, you know, and that, that, is, that is unnerving to me. There's two, there's two yeah. things that are unnerving to me around it. That, that is one of the biggest is that they are just taking for granted everything that comes to them and they don't even know how to smoke test a lot of the basic stuff that yeah. just is presented to them. The Google machine says it's true, so it right. must be true, right? right? And, and right. there's no ability to reason yeah. and think through that. So I'm yep. afraid that we almost have to go back and uh, get into almost a classical education model sometimes of logic and reason yeah. and equip our guys with some basic tools in this next generation or else we're, we're, it's, it's going to be a very interesting mix of, yeah. of how much the machine tells you you take at face value 
versus how much you right. are going to apply your own, you know, instinct to some of those questions as well. Question up here. Yeah. Yeah. So he, I think he basically just said we're, we're about to hit, hit a dystopia yeah. of uh, the, the, the big data haves and the big data have nots. And yeah. the, the ones who have it and use it are going to be dominant and the ones who don't are going to die and be dysfunctional. And uh, we're going to like a Hunger Games for big data, right? <laughs> so we got to... And I think his question right. to you is, you know, is there yeah. is there a better vision than that? Is there a yeah. better hope? Or is that kind of yeah. the reality of the immediate future? No, no fortunately, I, I believe there really is a fundamentally better vision than that. I, th I think that the the uh, energy, inertia, momentum behind the, the open data movement is going to become far more pervasive than what it is today, right? I mean, uh, open data is the, the ability for organizations of all size and types, especially governments, to make available the data that should be available in proper formats. You combine that notion of open data with the next generation of the, of the, of the web, uh, a, a richer semantic-based web than what we know today, and you have, I mean, you have an unbelievable new construct for creating intelligent applications. Um, small, simple example, just because I like to ground things in reality. Uh, last week, I had to travel from my office, which is in San Francisco, about five miles south of here in a place called Potrero Hill, um, to a location very near to here. And um, I chose a route using a Google map and followed that route blindly. And it took me by AT&T Park. What was going on at AT&T Park that evening? A home game. Why didn't Google know that there was a home game that night? Why did it take me by AT&T Park? The, the schedule's online. It, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> different, so it, it's maddening, right? I mean, you're thinking it should be smarter than this, right? It should be smarter. I blamed me, of course, because I'm a baby boomer. Uh, my millennial nephew would have blamed Google. And so there we have it. There we are. Avoid the game day. But, but really, that is an expectation that does yeah. not seem unreasonable. Right. It is. Sad. Right. Yeah. And um, yeah. we, we've had several, uh, it's come up in several different conversations. Um, you're, you're involved in a lot of uh, uh, pro business lobby stuff, although a lot of times too, which is, which is really great, the government level. So I'm curious on your take. Uh, from a business perspective as we move forward, is there any expectation of privacy? Should there be? Or, or is that ship sailed? There is no privacy. Get used to it. That's the future. Yeah, that's Scott McNeely. Uh, so I'm, I'm, um, I, I think I have an unusual view on this, so I'll prepare you for that. I, I, I actually believe that there will be a point at which uh, personally, uh, our person will reclaim the rights to our privacy and will actually be able to, as needed, will be able to expose what we wish to expose, maybe even for fee, for a fee. Uh, so I think the, the notion, I don't think it's as simple ultimately as. Should we just give up all privacy rights? And when it, we know that whenever we sign up for something, it's just going to expose more of us v versus no, everything should be locked down and it's mine. I, I actually see more of a commerce-oriented approach to this eventually, where uh, as, in, as an individual, you'll, you'll have a persona that you will define and allow ex to expose certain types of data. And you may very well make money based on that. Uh, and I think that's a great way to write, which otherwise might be you know, a free-for-all, uh, you know, being able to spam me or target me on social media and so on, that should come at a cost, and that would probably create a, a better economic environment at the same time. It would, or, or even product, right? So think about that in yeah. an old analog. That's right. It would be the equivalent of, under that model, the newspapers would have paid you money. Yeah, that's right, yeah. For the privilege of reading and, right. and reading the ads. Assuming and, that those ads fully supported yeah. their budget, that's exactly right. Exactly, yeah. and that's an, that is an interesting take on it. So, uh, one more question, and then we're going to wrap up with some final thoughts. Yeah. So, um, thank you so much for sharing some industry trends. But I want to come back exactly to the industry and get your thoughts on the data visualization industry. 
pay him <laughs> no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no but I got something for can you, you later <laughs> can you, can, yeah can you repeat the question yeah so he's asking me about the data visualization space and I think you chose those words carefully right data visualization a category of BI that's emerged in the last couple of years that provides rich exploration of data visually for a usually more of a business oriented user right and you're wondering about will it consolidate again there are lots of players because it's become quite fractured Mm, yes. Mm. Okay. And will it become more enterprise wide in so doing? Right. And then you had another another question about. He asked about Jasper. Yeah, about Jasper. Oh no, yeah, yeah. I just wanted you to repeat that part. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, right. And then what are we doing? Would we be interested in more vertical integration within our tool, potentially back to the data source? Okay. Uh, so data visualization and data exploration are are a couple of the most interesting new facets to BI to come along in quite some time. And we've, we've been part of this at Jaspersoft and we've watched it at the same time. Uh, we believe ultimately that it's about, about greater, better self-service so that everybody in, or, in an organization should be able to visualize and work with the data and explore that data in a way that's rich and meaningful to them. Today, the data virtualization vendors, the primary data, those who are known for exploration and virtualization, or visualization rather, the data visualization vendors have been very desktop-centric. Right? They, they've, they've created desktop-centric models that allow a power user, Excel, somebody who's probably very comfortable with Excel, to move to a much better tool. And, and that's a good environment for them, and it's a good market. But there aren't that many of those people in the world. There are, you could look at any organization and there are a lot of people who need Excel and are power users and they know a lot about their data, but it's not a big percentage of an enterprise. It's probably a single digit percentage of an enterprise, seven, eight, nine percent. Um, what, what I think is a far more powerful model is, as I said earlier, it's taking self-service techniques and, and, and the ability to reach into the data and analyze it and put it inside of the applications that you use every day so that you're not leaving that application and going over here to visualize it. As soon as you leave your application that you're used to using every day and going over to someplace new to analyze data, all of a sudden you're properly skeptical about the validity of that data. Where did it come from? I, I, here's what I'm used to working with as a, as a transactional oriented or process oriented data set. Why am I now over here using a new tool that's completely separate from where I am typically during the course of the day? So, so we think fundamentally the way you reach a very big audience, and I don't mean you know, going from single digit to 20%, I'm talking about going to 90% of an organization of knowledge workers. Um, the way you do that is you build self-service, incredibly well embedded and affordable analytics right inside of the applications that people use every day. So that, that's a fundamentally different view. It's an inside out view right, of, of how do I bring analytics to everybody who needs it. Don't make them go someplace new to get those analytics, bring analytics to the applications and processes that they use every day. And that's been Jaspersoft's mission for since inception. Um, we try to do that very well, and we think that's the way to reach 90 plus percent of an enterprise. Uh, it means you've gotta, it's gotta be affordable, because you can't sit, and you, if, if a customer of ours is doing an ROI calculation to see if they can justify their purchase, we've done something wrong. I mean, it should be that brain dead. It's like, of course I'm gonna go do this. No doubt about it. The benefits for the small cost of getting this to 90% of my organization potentially is far too enormous to, to, to even consider needing to do an ROI on it. It's just unquestioned. Um, it has to be great self-service though. The visualization techniques, the ability to access the right data stores and present things in a contextually relevant way and allow somebody to explore within that data set, it has to be beautiful. Consumer-like, drag and drop simplicity, point and click, they have to be able to dwell and explore the data so they can answer their own questions. Um, so affordability, embeddability, and self-service are, are really going to be what drive the data visualization into the really the largest percentage of the enterprise. Did that help on the first part of the question? And then I'll stop there before I talk about uh, answer your Jaspersoft question. Is that, did that help? Yeah. So, um, I mean, what, what we, try to be really, we try to be really great at Jaspersoft at, at doing reporting through multidimensional analytics. And we've done very well, I think, at partnering to get most of the rest. 
I don't see us in the next several years deviating from that. We, we partner very well. We need to be agnostic from the data stores because our customers have everything that you could imagine and then some. And, I, and we want our tool to be able to access data that sits in any place, any location. It should be usable by our tool. And, and so that doesn't usually fit well with, you know, owning a single type of data store doesn't really fit in that model where we necessarily have to be agnostic. Now, we've done certain techniques within our server. We use an in-memory caching system. It's a non-persistent data store. It's a caching mechanism to provide, to provide that self-service and rich interaction. Um, but it's not a data store. It's non-persistent. And uh, it solves a very specific technological issue that helps make an end user's experience much better. Um, and so you'll see us com continue to build out that edifice of technology from, from beautiful reports all the way through to multidimensional analytics in a consumer in a consumer oriented everything inside of the web browser modern architecture approach but i don't think you'll see us get into things like statistical analytics like you'd find with r we'll partner for that i don't think you'll see us get into the database realm because it's just there's too varied and it's too too uh, important for us to be a great partner there i think you'll see us stick to our knitting and just build out and deliver more value around the four walls that we have that we've become known for so I tell you what, we're gonna. I, I pride myself on on being very respectful of everybody's time. Do you have a few minutes after? Yes. So can, let's. Uh, Brian will be available after for some questions. But this has been fantastic dialogue. It makes the conversations much better. But for those of you that have other commitments, I do want to let you know we are at time. So Brian, thank you very much. My pleasure. Appreciate My pleasure. It. Thanks for the great questions. And thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the great questions. It was a pleasure.